Hello everybody, this is Eli with Elfbait, <clears throat> and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the character that is, the character that could be, and the character that should be. Um, so this particular uh, video comes from a couple of conversations I've had recently in regard to uh, how players are playing their characters versus how their characters are built, uh, and in some cases how their characters were conceptualized uh, and so these are the kind of the uh, for me this has always been a bit of a struggle when dealing with with players um, it, not a struggle in a bad way but it is something that comes up so players kind of from to start with the beginning you know players when they're coming down to a table uh, tabletop game and they're gonna go ahead and make their characters <clears throat> they usually have an idea in mind um, or you know, most of the time sometimes folks come to the table they draw a blank and they just decide that they're going to let the stats take them where they are. Whatever the case be, maybe there is going to be a preconception about who their character is, what their character is going to be. Um, and right now I'm just going to outline this. We'll kind of go into the the the, 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 the details of that. So then <clears throat> you get to the character that they end up making. That's the character that is. That's the, you know, that's the character they want character that is there's a little bit more to this to this midpoint so character that is is actually a combination in my mind of what character they ended up making and then what how they're playing that character now those two may not line up so you know these are kind of a, it's kind of sort of an a and b in that section section or that second section um excuse me <clears throat> bit of a scratchy through it this morning so then you have the character that uh, could be. And this is the character that you as the DM or maybe the player has in mind or maybe the both of you have talked about. And so the, where the trouble comes through is when these three things don't, three, I guess, three and a half, if you can consider the two points to, to the second, two parts to the second point, when they don't line up. And so... <clears throat> You know, talk about how this happens, and then uh, I'd like to kind of go into you know some you know point by point some suggestions on 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 how you can maybe take a look at that and address it. So the first one is kind of the the simple one. This is the character uh, um, they, that 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 should be. This is the character that they wanted. This is what they come in for their preconception with their preconception, the, the idea, the spark of their character. Now, the spark of the character is usually some, either some archetype that the, that the player seen in a movie, um, read in a book, an idea that, that you know, popped in their head when they're, you know, eating their cornflakes, whatever the point being, this is, this is their basic idea. Whether it's something they came to the table with or something that formulates when they start flipping through the book, whatever it is. <clears throat> and this is where <clears throat> I find that, uh, a lot of the problems actually germinate from this stage. And it's not so much that people um, come up with bad ideas, um, you know, because any idea can really be spun to, in, into a good idea. It's that this is the most unformed part of the character concept. But a lot of times players are going to go ahead and hang on to this part of their character because it was the, it, it, often it ties in deeply with that emotional. Um, inspirational element that that first you know created that concept and so that is very deeply embedded in their character regardless of how they end up playing it or what it could be down the road this is how it is this is the emotional seed of that character okay so <clears throat> at this point what what is your opportunity to, to really kind of jump here in, in here and help uh, talking with a player um, as a GM, talking with your player is a really good idea at this point. You know, kind of, hey, okay, I get that you want to make that tiefling. Do you understand what tieflings are? This is how tieflings are in my campaign. Um, you want to play an elf. Okay, elves are slightly different in my world. You want to make sure that your player at this point really understands how your your campaign setting differs from rules as written or it, you know even not rules as written i mean it could be just a matter of make sure that they understand what they're they're getting into um it's really easy to just grab something based on a cool piece of concept art and you're like oh i want to play that cool guy as a gray skinned giant with tattoos uh only to find out that a goliath is a lot different than just a really cool you know giant sub race uh and you know, and, and that it plays in a certain way 
um, or, or that in the campaign setting, because even though you may not be breaking from rules as written, the campaign setting itself may set those Goliaths or Tieflings or whatever in a different light than they are in uh, in another campaign world that, say, the player may be familiar with, or or maybe in the default campaign setting that he's 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 read them from, <clears throat> uh, or you know maybe. So that's that's one thing. Make sure that they understand their character and how it fits into the world. The other thing to do too at this point is to communicate with them and make sure that you understand where their idea is coming from. And this is an attempt to sort of head off some of these misconceptions and preconceptions that'll come up in their characters that will affect their gameplay down the way, down the road. And what we're trying to do with this process here, is, you know, in examining you know the character that <clears throat> that should be the character that is and the character that can be. When we're trying to examine that, <clears throat> the, the, the goal here is to try and uh, minimize that friction or the disappointment factor down the way as the player plays that character out. So the other thing, too, is inspiration for characters often comes from sources that are not necessarily uh, tabletop game friendly uh, or they may not be campaign friendly. Uh, if your player is coming in and he's basing his character off of you know, a video game character or a book character, uh, he may have in his head that that character works like those games, like those books, like that comic, the movie, whatever it is. Um, and you want to make sure that they understand that yes, that's a cool germ, uh, you know, for a, for you know the the, the, the a good seed for the character. You want to make sure that they understand that uh, while you're while the guy can do that in that video game, he's not necessarily going to be able to do that in. In D and D, we well, can try and find a way to make it work. You know, is there a special attack that he has in the game, which could be uh, justified or explained as a sorcerer or a warlock ability, or maybe maybe a priest is the way to go, or maybe you know, while the dragon man in the game has wings and a tail, and dragonborn don't, you know, is that really important to the character? Uh, if so, then you know maybe that's it's it's better to 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 go a different route, or you know as a DM, here's your opportunity to maybe flex on rules as written, and you know give that character something that's a little different just to make him a little bit special. You know, is it going to break the game if he's a little bit off center? Yeah, probably not. Uh, wings wings can really unbalance things because suddenly you have a uh, a PC who can fly, uh, which can really uh, basically eliminate some of the dangers and threats that you're going to throw at him as a DM. So finding ways to limit that could be a thing. So understanding where the character concept comes from and making sure that the player understands the difference between their idea and how the game works, that's super important. Um, because this way they will go into the game ex knowing what to expect. They're not going to get down the adventure, you know, down the adventure path and so come to that t that chance to use an ability and say, okay, well, I'm going to fly. And you're like, <clears throat> no, dragon men in this world don't have wings. And then you end up with this point of, this moment of disappointment where the player, just, oh, I just assumed that, you know, I said I was going to make it like the dragon man from such and such game and he has wings. You know, why don't I have wings? So, you know, that that guy from that character, from that character from that video game, can shadow walk. I I just assumed, because we're you know that was my idea that it would work here. So there's that. Um, <clears throat> you know, also making sure they understand the rules for whatever they're making. Sorry about that, my throat again. Um, so yeah, making sure they understand the rules for whatever they may they're making. Um, don't let them make a warlock when they want a wizard. Don't make them make. Don't let them make a barbarian when they want a fighter. You know, if they want a ranger, that's fine. But you know, make sure that when they're making that ranger, they understand that the ranger is eventually going to be sort of a spellcasting class, in, or can be. Um, you know, there are ways to make ranger type characters using rogues and fighters and stuff too. So um, sometimes the concept may have a, a tagline in it that doesn't necessarily jive with the character class or doesn't necessarily have to um, uh, inform the character class. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's really easy to sit there and say, okay, well, this guy is from a, you know, kind of a backwards tribe in the north. 
of course he's going to be a barbarian but a barbarian has very specific abilities and stuff going through it if you're going to make say just to draw from archetype if you're going to make conan uh while conan is often used as the archetype for barbarians um at least visually and conceptually he really doesn't read as a barbarian at least in my experience he's much more of a fighter kind of rogue type character you know who just happens to be from a barbarian culture conan is a very cagey canny individual who's full of insight and uh and and doesn't co really come across as the ragey unfettered you know primal sort of a warrior that a barbarian is you know that said you know just because uh your character i mean on the flip side you know you could sit there and say my character is from a civilized world um but he loses it in battle he he just is gripped by it you know he's he's simple he's not very worldly yes he comes from a civilized area but he's disengaged from the culture as it as, as it is or maybe he's lived a life where he hasn't been <clears throat> overly exposed you know maybe he's a gladiator a slave gladiator so yes battle rage is the thing but he's not you know he's not going to be very worldly so i mean just make sure that the concept and the character class are, are fully understood so I mean, there could be a whole other video on, on ways to interpret character classes, and certainly that's something I could do down the road. Uh, but so then, <clears throat> then we get to the character that is. So the character, I mean, the character that 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 should have been, or the character that you know that that the you start out with the, what the player's original concept is. Now we are down to the character that they are, the character that they're playing. <clears throat> and so this is where we get into that two sides. There's their stats. This is what they actually have. This is, you know, I've got a rogue, I've got a fighter, I've got a barbarian. But then here's where most of the trouble in player character interactions, player slash character interactions, uh, come from, uh, interplay comes from. And that's that when you have that player who's got a character and he's not really playing it as his character it was, was made. Um, you know, an example that a friend of mine shared recently, and one of the reasons for this video is he has a, there's a rogue in his party who, uh, while he occasionally does roguey things, he's very much more of a murder hobo kind of fighty guy. And so, you know, the that character, while built as a rogue, isn't really playing as a rogue. And now that doesn't shut down who he is. And it doesn't make it an invalid character selection. It just makes it a little trickier for a the the DM to really um, read how to how to really how to how to build a game for that character or a party that includes that character. It also makes it difficult for the rest of the party to really rely on him. If you have a rogue who's not doing the rogue thing, uh, but he's the rogue the party is going to end up having to compensate and understand that while they have a rogue in their party, he's really not reliable as a rogue. It's just like, it'd be like having a cleric who isn't overly concerned with healing uh, or supporting the party, but really wants to go out there and crusade uh, for his, uh, his God and, uh, you know, the rest of the party be damned. Or, you know, you know, maybe you have a particularly physical trait heavy wizard in the party. So, while he is a wizard, uh, he's also able to deal out a pretty fair amount of damage in combat when he, you know, because, well, you know, he's got a plus three strength bonus. It's a pretty burly wizard, but it, you can you can do it. I've played fumbly, fumbly thieves in the past where they're, they've got low stats, and I've played, you know, intelligent fighters. I've played intelligent barbarians. So there's that. But the problem is, is that when you have that player who is playing the character very different from what his stats are. Um, there is a lot of room for abuse in that too, because you might have a player who just wants to play the character that he has in his head, not the one that's on his sheet. So when he's off going, oh yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and engage with the nobles, and you're looking at his background, and he's commoner uh, as a background, and he's a rogue. There's nothing about this character that really says that he should have this standing that he's playing off as it's it's fine for player agency if the rogue wants to go ahead and say he's going to be the one being the face man for the party and talk to the to the nobles 
Uh, but if that player is playing his character as if, you know, that's just his normal thing, that's where he fits in, and his background and his character really don't support it, it's going to fall flat. It's really not going to feel right. Um, and, you know, he's going to be really wading in where he can't engage. But the worst part of this is when you have those characters who are there to do something and they or the and they the, the player doesn't really follow through with that character. And this kind of goes back to the rogue um, uh, that my friend was mentioning. So he would do things that are pretty typically roguish. He would actually go ahead and, you know, uh, find the traps and disarm the traps. But then him and also to a degree the rest of the party because they went along with this there would be no follow through so there's an expensive there's the expenditure of resources the expenditure of time the die rolls the table that you know your time at your table is 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 it's it's valuable so if you're if you have a character who in the party you know, player whose character in the party is going through and doing things that are taking table time and then they're really ultimately just for nothing. That is wasted time. And it's okay if that happens on occasion. Sometimes, you know, you wade through the traps and you just realize that, you know, the stakes are too high. We need to revisit this. Let's, let's regroup. But the regrouping is the motivation, not just backing away from the traps. So there's, there's that aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, too, is like when a player... Sometimes this doesn't happen by intent. Sometimes the player just has trouble conveying his statistics, his character sheet, into his gaming. Um, <clears throat> somebody might make a noble, and they just don't know how to act nobly. <clears throat> so they don't do things nobly. Uh, they don't. Um, they don't engage in in noble pursuits. They don't engage the other nobles that they run into. Um, you might have a fighter in the party who's not particularly aggressive uh, as a person. And so maybe just, you know, he's not really the first one to wade into a fight or he's really not pushing the fight or playing his character to his potential. He may want to. It may, see, it may seem like a great chance to be somebody he's not, which is what role playing is all about. But really, when it comes down to it, you know, he's not committing, he's not really pushing that aspect of his character. And so, you know, you have, again, you have a party who now has a fighter or whatever class it is, who's not fulfilling their role in the, in the group. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not to say that there aren't role-playing opportunities here where you might have the conflicted fighter who maybe has already seen enough bloodshed getting up to level one and is just done with it. Or... Maybe, yes, he's a fighter, but he really doesn't want to kill. But that's role-playing. That should come out through role-playing. We're not talking about somebody who is playing a character, and that character is justifiable. Um, that character's choices are justifiable. Now, you're going to find some players who are going to sit there and say, well, that's just my character. But as a GM, you really will quickly learn to see who is playing their character because that's the role-playing choices they're making and who's really just not looking at their character sheet or caring what's on their character sheet or maybe not understanding what's on their character sheet. So, you know, here we have, the, you know, the second part of the problem, which is, you know, not the problem, but the issue or whatever you want to call it, but, you know, interpreting and playing your character as he is written, you know, um, and still playing him as you want. And, <clears throat> you know, not bogging down the game with this idea, you know, with this character that is uh, non-committal, um, causing problems for the rest of the group because he's doing things that are way outside of his breadth. Um, you know, so there's that. So this brings into how to really deal with that sort of a character. That this is what it, you know referred to as the character that could be. So. <clears throat> Using the rogue example that my, my you know from my friend's uh, campaign, um, you know there is an opportunity to, and and part of this comes down to perception as players as DMs. Um, sometimes it comes down to just changing how you're looking at that character so it's 
it, it minimizes or mitigates a bit some of the uh, the frustration you might be feeling. And that's the thing. Some of these, the reason I'm talking about this is that a lot of times this is what generates some of the frustration at the table. Why is the fighter not fighting? Why is the cleric not clericking? Why is the rogue never being roguish? These things will stick in people's craws unless there's a serious, unless there's a good role playing reason for it. But when it happens, sometimes it comes down to just reinterpreting in your head this the this character and kind of what their 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 archetypical role is. So, in the case of the rogue, and to you know follow through with that that example, if he is a really murder hobo y fighter, you know, picks fights, does, you know, tries to really just bash his way through things, but he is a rogue, maybe he's less of a sneak thief, second story man, you know, whatever. Maybe he's just more of a dock thug, you know, a, you know, a, you know, backstreet, you know, you know, alley kind of tough guy who has rogue skills because that's what you pick up when you live in that on in, in that life you know sure he can pick a lock he know he's heard talk because he hangs around with those guys maybe his uncle showed him how to you know disarm some simple traps when he was a kid but he didn't take to it maybe for him it was all about being a goon sure he could pick a lock and sneak into the you know or or you know climb up and get through the window of the warehouse in the middle of the night but some, maybe for him, it's more like just taking a pair of bolt cutters, cutting the lock off the front door, going in and just walking out and taking his stuff. And when the security shows up, when the city guard whatever shows up, he just wants to punch them and fight his way out. He's got rogue skills, but maybe he doesn't think of himself as a rogue. So while the player maybe may not even be consciously making this decision, the way he's playing that character kind of informs at least a way to perceive that character and, you know using my example from before with the with the cleric who doesn't want to heal and seems to be focusing more on crusading and fighting things and doesn't want to support the party he wants to be a little bit more front you know front line i um, wants to do the job of a fighter that's fine maybe his you know could be maybe just the way to think about that guy is yes his he's not so into his ecclesiastical duties and he just really wants to you know, take the fight to the to the enemies for you know for his God and his faith. Maybe the path, the character that could be, maybe this character later on is a good candidate. And this is something you can talk to him as you know as a, you know as a GM about is maybe he should multi-class into paladin. You know, shift his way over to something a little bit more fitting his role, or take some fighter levels. So while he's not a paladin, he can still you know he's he's reflecting his character a little bit more. That also could be role. The, the other thing too with these, with the kind of the going forward with these characters, is, is their decisions as a player and ultimately what their character does could then inform the story. Um, you know, the thief who is not much of a thief, uh, if he gets himself involved with the other thieves in the area, um, or he's performing himself, he's performing his duties in a not so subtle fashion. You know could be a negative rep for him it could be a positive rep you know he's he's a good fighter cool but there's gonna be these guys who are like he's messing it up for us he's making it hard he's clumsy i don't like that you know crime bosses are gonna come by and say look i get that you're trying to make a living but hey you know your blatant actions are making it tougher for us to do our jobs you know the city guard is now strengthened because there's a guy out there who's Anytime he tries to pull a pull a job, he's bashing people's skulls. He's doing damage, so they need to increase the guards, which makes it harder to sneak in. You know that that cleric who is focusing more on vanquishing foes uh, and instead of uh, necessarily following the tenets of his of his religion uh, is going to be looking at a situation where. You know, maybe other members of his faith start to hear about him, and you know this reflects poorly on his standing with with the church. Ultimately, it might even affect his standing with his deity. And as a GM, you have the opportunity here to uh, 
uh, turn that into a storyline. I mean, what happens to a cleric when his god loses faith in him? When his, when his deity loses, loses, you know, uh, can't really rely on his 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 chosen cleric. I mean, clerics are people who have their powers because a god has invested power in them based on their belief. What happens when that guy though stops focusing on the duties as a cleric and just wants to be a beat stick? You know, the god's gonna, you know, and that god decides to pull back. What does that do to the character? Um, if it comes down, which what it what it ultimately comes down to is this process of, you know, you can avoid most of these these two points, these second two points, by really focusing up front on helping the player to understand the character he's making. But if they end up playing a character that is very different from the one that they made, it can often be. And this is just really more of a coping mechanism than anything else. It's not even necessarily um, anything that's going to do anything for the player other than reduce your frustration as a GM when dealing with that player. Uh, and possibly the other players, too. Because, I mean, if you're a player sitting at the table and the thief is never doing the thief thing, uh, you're going to get frustrated, too. But if you can start seeing them in a different light, that character as a different character, even if the player is not specifically role-playing that character as that sort of an archetype. <clears throat> Chances are, if he's playing the character off-book, he's really not presenting much of an archetype. He might be, and in which case, you just roll with it. I mean, not everybody's a good thief, not everybody's a good cleric, not everybody's a good fighter. You, you know, you could literally have a pacifist fighter if you wanted to, which wouldn't be much of a fighter character, but you could have a fighter who has good role-playing reasons to be conflicted about fighting, and really chooses not to fight. <clears throat> there is a fighter in my game, my Monday game, who does not like to start out dealing lethal damage. He has a blunt scimitar that he begins fights with against when, when he's fighting foes who he feels are not necessarily evil. It is, he calls it his lesson giver. He actually uses that. So, you know, that's not exactly the same thing as a pacifist, but potentially this could be an issue for for the party down the road and it really comes down to accepting the player and, and how he plays his character but really getting back to my point and i realize that this is kind of rambly sorry is that learning to interpret internally the actions of the player when he's not playing his his, his character as written uh, can help it can help you as a gm and also as a player to be comfortable at the table and 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 not feel so frustrated that the player is not uh, performing the duties of what they should do. I mean, kind of comes down to just being a decent person and letting people have their fun. But we all know that sometimes when the when the players are not playing their characters um, in the way that they're written, it does affect fun. It can affect fun, and so just maybe changing your changing your mindset can help. And the third point really is as a GM, or even as players, and this is another opportunity for players, they're not really wanting this to be a, a player video, but it, it goes both ways. Um, helping the player find the niche for his character and how to help him refine the character to where the way he likes to play fits the character and its role in the game will ultimately make the whole game better. A lot of players who maybe make a character early on, they made that character with a certain spark of inspiration, but they never thought about how the long game of that character played. You know, I want to make a ragey barbarian. I want to make a barbarian who just bashes heads. Well, even as the player of that character, it may turn out that bashing heads just... Man, you know... That gets tiresome. You want to do something different, or it's just not as satisfying as you hoped it would be. Um, and so, you know, down the road, maybe you're not playing so barbarian-ish, and everybody's like, but he's the barbarian. You know, look at him. He's wearing boar tusks and a loincloth and carries a big old snaggly-toothed axe, and he's just... But he's playing himself more civilized. All right. So character development comes to play here. After a few levels, maybe that barbarian is going to start, you know, multi multi uh, classing into a more refined form of of combatant, a fighter. Maybe he finds religion. Whatever, you know, 
just because you're playing a barbarian doesn't mean you have to stay the wild crazy dude if you adventure long enough you know by you know ninth tenth level how many months or years of game time have you been adventuring and maybe you've while you can still summon that rage on a primal level maybe you're starting to really learn from the world um so yeah so helping the player to find a way to play the character that synergizes how he wants to play it with what it is 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 certainly um useful down the road for for player satisfaction for gm satisfaction and for ultimately for the game's health uh, nothing will burn a game out nothing will kill a game faster than people getting frustrated um and like, like like I said before, a bit of this comes down to sort of a coping mechanism. If you're playing with a group of people that you, all, you generally enjoy, but there's something frustrating about the character that comes up now and again, just finding a way to let it roll off your back, but also fit your internal your internal um, interpretation of the story, your 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 kind of visualization of the story, um, that will help. Uh, you know, it's 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 not hard to do to look at you know the rogue and say, okay, he's just a street thug. He's not really a fighter. We had a rogue in one of my games who wasn't even a rogue by trade. He was a rogue by his upbringing. He was the son of the innkeeper. He just grew up doing things like cold cocking people when they needed to be bounced, backstab. Um, you know, hanging out with in patrons and learning this and that. You know, you know he learned how to pick locks uh, i believe that character had a pretty low pick lock skill but still i mean this is third edition character but um you know so he you know, he had learned roguish things but he wasn't a rogue he just was a rogue by by happenstance and that's how we interpreted his character so you know kind of bring it around you know help your make sure your players understand the characters they're making help them to make a character that fits uh, not just their short-term idea their initial inspiration but um, a lot make sure that they understand where that character can go and what he can be uh, once they start playing that character uh, there is a refinement process everybody gets into their groove and so the character that you started playing the character that you made may not fit your play style so um, work with the character work with the players to help him grow into his character um and you know those coping mechanisms are just internal dialogue in your head of how you interpret what they're doing and you know um, maybe he's just not maybe he in his head there's a reason for it you know just just go ahead and make sure that you're letting them have their fun and finding a way to 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 justify that in your head as long as they're not breaking the game or really acting out of character or making stuff do, doing stuff that they really shouldn't be doing in that character um it's usually pretty easy to get past that and then also as a dm as a player helping that character uh helping the player i should say get that character to fit the play whether that's through um new character con new character abilities new classes whatever um or just helping him coaching him on role playing these are going to help you out in the you know in the in the lifespan of the character um, anyways, uh, reaching that magic mark where I like to keep these in, uh, and make uh, simple, quick videos. Um, if you have any other thoughts or questions or ideas in regard to the topic for today, just go ahead and drop them down in the comments, like, subscribe, share, and thanks for checking out Elfbait. Get out there and get out there and game. Have a good one.